Thanks all for coming. Now for the next 40 to 50 minutes, we're going to talk about making software design decisions, and preferably sensible ones. My name is Bert-Jan Schrijver. I work at OpenValue. I'm also active for the NLJUK, the Netherlands Java Use Group. So I'm kind of a Java guy, but I think most of the things I'm going to mention will apply to other languages just uh, as well. So for the next, uh, say, 45 minutes, we're going to look into some definitions. Uh, I'll tell a short story about flexibility in software. We're going to look at different levels where you can make choices of going generic or specific. Uh, I'll give you some tools to, to help decide. We're going to look at the cost of generic solutions. I'll give you some tips on when and why to, to go generic. We may have time for a bonus topic, depending on how much questions you have and how, how fast I talk. And every story needs an end, and this is no, no exception. But let's start at the, at the beginning. We're talking about software design. What is software design? Well, if you want to know what something is, at least in my case, you go to Wikipedia and you type software design. And then Wikipedia says something along the ranks of, it's the activity following requirement specification and before programming. So that basically whatever you do, once you know what to do and the actual coding, everything in between is, is design. Or uh, software design usually involves problem solving and planning a software solution or the process of envisioning and defining software solutions to one or more sets of problems. So I think we can say that design is basically coming up with solutions for problems. It's the thinking you do between having general level requirements and doing the actual code. So then what is software architecture? When is something designed and when is it architecture? I guess that the question we can ask in return is, does it matter? Do we care whether something is design or architecture? I'd say that both are about making significant decisions, where significant is measured by the cost of change. So if you get it wrong, how expensive, in terms of time, is it to fix it? So design, I'd say, is typically local, within a class, within a module, within a project, and architecture is typically on a higher level. So it's on a project level, organization level. And uh, my point that I'll iterate later is that you can make decisions on solving stuff specific and generic on all of those levels. So now that we know, somewhat know what design is, let's uh, ask ourselves when is something specific or when is something generic? So a specific solution is, is tailor-made for use in a single place. It's a one-off. It's tailored to a specific problem or a specific uh, scenario. And it may not be easily adaptable to other uh, situations. Whereas if you go generic, it's typically flexible and reusable. We love that as developers, right? Let's make it flexible and reusable because then we may need it in the future. And you can apply it to a wide range of, of problems or scenarios, a, a Swiss pocket knife. Typically something that's in some way generified so that you can use it in, in more than one place. So why don't we do everything generic? Well, I'll, I'll talk to that in a bit. So a, another concept I'd like to introduce is uh, hierarchical decomposition. And this is for me a key concept of, of software architecture and looking at systems. It's about recognizing that a system, you can look at a system from different, different views, and every view has an, an extra level of depth. So if we would look at, you can see it as a stack of blocks, uh, for example. Uh, if we look at Google, for example, at the top level, you would have google.com. If you sign in and look at the architecture of Google, and I'm making this up on, on the spot, probably there's something like an indexer, there's something that does a search, there's something that does ads, and there's something that does ranking in the results. So that could be the second level. So if you then zoom in again to the, uh, the indexer uh, component, there's probably uh, an explorer that maps the internet. There's a, a spider that spiders the internet. There's a scraper or parser that parses HTML uh, and more. So my point is that uh, you can make choices to go generic or specific on all those different levels. And having those levels also helps you reasoning uh, about a system. So I would say it's about breaking a system or problem into smaller parts that you can easily understand. And another approach is the, the C4 model uh, from Simon Brown for software architecture. Uh, Simon def defined four levels that you can use to look at a system. The overall system and its context, the uh, uh, high level containers, the next level is individual components, and the fourth level is actual code. And this helps in reasoning about systems on, on the right level. So um, another concept we need before I can, well, finally <laughs> make my, start making my points about generic specific is we need to look at coupling. So uh, coupling, well, the definition is that it's the, the degree of interdependence between building blocks of software. 
So building block can be a class or a component or a module or a service or a project, however you want to call it. And typically you have coupling if when you change something and then something else that you don't want to change needs to change as well. Uh, it, so it's a measure of how closely connected two components, uh, components are. And typically you're aiming for low, low coupling. And it's usually contrasted with uh, cohesion. So cohesion is the agree to which elements of a building block uh, belong together. So how well does this, does this thing do one thing and only one thing? Cohesion is high, and typically you also have low coupling. So there are loads of different types of coupling. There's uh, coupling by inheritance, where you inherited fields or uh, methods from, from a superclass. You can have coupling based on messages or events. If you're in event-driven or message-based systems, there's uh, one piece that sends messages and the other one that receives messages, and they both need to speak the same language. You can have temporal coupling, which basically means that one system, system A needs to do something for in, in order for system B to continue with that result. So A needs to finish first and then B can do something. You can have coupling on data types. For example, if you have like uh, shared uh, data types for REST clients or responses that you share between projects, when you change one, the other needs to change as well. And you can have coupling based on data. If two components access the same piece of data in a database or on an S3 bucket or, or whatever, they're also coupled. And I think the most common one is you have coupling based on, on code or API. So there's one class that calls a function in another class or that uses an API of a library. And that's the one we're going to look at in more, in more detail. So I was recently uh, rereading uh, the book, uh, The Unicorn Project by Gene Kim, which is a nice novel about the ideals of DevOps. And one of those ideals is locality and simplicity. So, well, simplicity, you probably all understand. It needs to be easy to understand. And locality means that a team can change a piece of software, uh, preferably in one place. And they don't need to go to 10 other places or go to other teams or other Git repositories to change something. So if you, if you have locality, you have independence because you can change something locally in your code base, change whatever you want to change, and then don't, no need to, bur to um, um, burden, bo what was the word I'm looking for? Burden other teams with doing stuff uh, for you. So um, the point is that if you have locality, then you can quickly change things. If you have coupling, you have a dependency. If you need to talk to another team to change things for you, it's a dependency. And I think dependencies are, in my point of view, the mother of all slowdowns. If you are dependent on another team to do something for you, then you need to wait on them. If you're dependent on some library to be released, you need to wait. So you could see, in a way, dependencies and coupling as, as handcuffs. And the point is that if you, if you introduce a generic solution, you're also introducing coupling. So if you have a piece of code in one place, you need it somewhere else. If you copy-paste it to another place, is there coupling? No, you basically copy-paste something. They're still independent. But if you extract a piece of code into a generic library and then make a dependency on that generic library from two places, you have coupling. So coupling is not necessarily bad. I think every non-trivial system uh, needs to have some form, form of coupling because in, in general, you can only write a simple hello world application if you don't want any coupling. But you still need to be aware that making stuff generic increases coupling between those components. So we've probably all learned about clean code, uh, right? And one of the mantras of clean code is try. Don't repeat yourself. We shouldn't repeat ourselves. So uh, I think my problem there is that we shouldn't uh, apply this as a, uh, as a given that we should always adhere to. We should never repeat ourselves. Because the risk with dry, if you forcibly never repeat yourself and you don't have any piece of duplicated code in your entire code base, well, then you're going to introduce a lot of generic solutions uh, and also introduce a lot of coupling. Because every time you, you, you want to solve duplication, you move it to a central place and then two places link to that central place. So you introduce coupling. So you, you prevent duplication, which I think is good, which you do increase coupling. So there's a point I want to make that probably many of you <laughs> may not agree uh, with. But my point is that duplicated code, in essence, doesn't, doesn't hurt you. If I have a piece of code I need somewhere else, I copy it, it's fine there. If I copy it another time, it's fine. If I copy it another time, it's fine. It doesn't start hurting until I need to change that copied code because then I need to change it in two, three, four, five places. 
But as long as I don't need to change or fix it, it's not really a, a big problem. You could see it as a code smell because there's duplicated stuff, but it's highly independent of each other. And independence means locality, means speed. Obviously, on a theoretical level, this is easy to reason about. Um, but um, you should also not underestimate uh, the power of automated search and replace tools. I saw Sander, the keynote speaker from, from just before, walk in. He was walking in the path here with this slide on screen. I thought, oh no, Sander's co is coming here and going to beat me up. But luckily, he sat down, so that's... Uh, <laughs> so, but I, I think also do not um, uh, underestimate the, the, how, how easy it is to do global search and replaces in, in IDEs now, right? You have duplicated code. I want to fix something. Oh, now we need to change it in two places. Well, if you have like a rack search in place, it may be well doable. Obviously, take it with a, with a grain of salt, but in general, uh, keep it in mind. So we often say that design is about making things future-proof. I'm designing this so that I can easily extend it later. Isn't that as simple as, as, as uh, saying, um, well, if, if you want to make stuff future-proof, isn't it as simple as saying, can we predict the future? Well, probably we cannot, right? So should we be prepared for future changes? By all means, the nature of software is that it should be easy to change, right? But it's also pretty clear that we cannot predict any changes that, that are coming. So we can either prepare by making everything really generic and really easily adaptable, but we can also think about how do we design things so we can accommodate change. And how do you make code that is easy to change? Well, you write really simple code, because simple code is easy to understand and therefore easy to change. So when making choices here, I typically perform some sort of risk management. So when I need to make a design choice, I think about, okay, what's the, what's the risk of making a wrong decision? If, if this is a really fundamental decision and I get it wrong and it takes me weeks or years or months or, <laughs> or months or years to, to fix it, okay, then I need to think a little bit harder because there's a high impact decision. If it's a decision that I can revoke or, or um, reiterate in, in, in a day or maybe even a week, okay, maybe I should just can go along with the first thing that pops up in, in my mind. So I have an example to, uh, to explain the, the concept of, of being future-proof. So this is a story about flexibility in software. So I, I was working for a company that was doing um, software for governmental agencies. And typically these are uh, like written out to the public as uh, tenders, amputating it. And the system had been designed by two uh, information architects that had basically made the specifications for the entire system. And their, their experience was that software was hard to change. So in order to, and, 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 and the, one of the wishes from the, uh, the client was that it should be easy to change the software. So in order to fix this, they designed a really flexible system. So every uh, field on, the, on every screen you could edit in a database. Even all the lists that were shown on the screen, you could edit through an admin interface. And uh, well, to make it even easier, they designed two applications and they needed to synchronize with each other in some way. So it all would be really easy to change. So I, I didn't know this backstory when I joined the project, but I joined the project and I set up my environment and I opened the, the first, uh, the home screen that had maybe three pieces of information in there. And it took like five seconds to load. So I was like, that's pretty long, five seconds for a simple screen. So what's going on there? I asked to my colleague. And he said, well, it's, there's a database query going on. I said, okay. Well, I know um, a couple of, couple of things about database queries, so maybe can I have a look at the query to see if I can maybe optimize it? And he looked at me with a weird grin and he said, are you sure? And I said, yeah, sure, just get me the query. Well, I'll go print it for you, he said. I said, okay, fine. So I was sitting there looking at the door and he wasn't coming back. So he was away for 10, 12, 13 minutes. And then <laughs> 30 minutes later, the door, the door banged open because he had to kick it because he was wearing a stack of paper like this big. And he, he with a big smile, he threw it on my desk and said, here's the query. Maybe you can optimize it. <laughs> and it turned out it was not one query, it was 6,000 queries. Because it was um, well, a Java EE application with, with JPA and Hibernate and loads of uh, post construct, post load annotations. And basically there was an entire Christmas tree being fetched in memory because of all those things uh, that were made easy to change, right? All this flexibility. So it kind of came, became an inverse self-fulfilling prophecy where because they wanted the system to be easy to change, they had designed the system to be so complex that it became hard to change. 
So in the end, we were, we were able to convince the client that this wasn't going to work, that we needed to rebuild something really simple uh, that did exactly what the business wanted. And in the end, we succeeded by just writing simple code. Uh, and if you have simple code, then it's also easy to change. If you have a fast delivery and deploy process, it's also easy to deploy. So I think flexibility is also about having code that is easy to understand, easy to change. And, and Stefan Tilkov, who, who walks around here somewhere also, I think he said it best, he said, highly specific code is often preferable to sophisticated configuration. And I cannot agree more for, for this specific project. So we're in 15 minutes. I haven't said much about generic services specific. So let's start. First, think about those levels where we can make, make choices. So obviously, we can make choices on the code and class level. Is this going to be a reusable class or not? You can have the same uh, idea about manually versus generated code. So if, if the code is generated, if it's duplicated, is that another thing than when it's manually written code? I think so. I don't mind having generated code that's duplicated all over the place because it's generated at every build that I do, right? On a library level, am I going to build something myself? Am I going to use a library or am I going to extract generic logic to a reusable library? On a data level, so uh, am I going to use a generic data model in my organization or not? Or even better, a generic data model over multiple organizations. So I recall working for a client in the insurance industry. And uh, typically, there's insurance agents that sell policies, and there's insurers that actually have those policies. And they sometimes need to exchange information. So somebody had the idea, which was in, in, in essence not a bad idea, that it should be good to standardize this piece of communication, like which type of messages are being sent between those systems. And this was called uh, GIM. And GIM stands for Generike Interface Manager, so Generic Interface Manager. It was an interface, so the I was right, but there are two words that are big red flags, generic and manager, right? So the point was there was a generic data model, and uh, well, you should look at the data catalog for the piece of information you want to transfer, look at the catalog, map the fields to your fields, and then you will be fine, until there was a field that you had that you couldn't map to the data catalog. So what do you do then? Well, it's easy, you call the person that's maintaining the standard, you convince them that you need a new field, they agree, they draft a new version of the specification, they send out a specification for view view to all participants, everybody implements it, deploys it, and then you're Best case, six months ahead, right? But I need this piece of information now. So you agree with the insurance company that you put it in a field that's actually not used for this, uh, but at least you can continue. So I think that's, that's one of the grudges I have with generic interface, uh, data interface. You can have it on, on the service level. Uh, for example, uh, are you going to put something uh, in a generic service being used by multiple teams or not? Or going to keep the service for yourself? And even on organization level. So when are you going to do something specific for your project? Or are going to make a generic library or a generic service that other teams can use? It may save them time, but you do introduce coupling between those teams, between those projects. So how do you decide whether to go generic or specific? Well, a couple of tools to uh, help you uh, decide. I think the first one is asking yourself, do we really need, need this now? That's probably a quote from you, Sander, right? Uh, you can also see it as, as YACNI. Uh, you, you ain't gonna need it, or you ain't gonna need it yet. So do we really need to make this generic now? Do we see multiple use cases? Well, probably not. My favorite is the five Ws. So if somebody wants to do something, and you want to figure out what they are doing and why, you apply the five Ws. So the first is why. Why, why do you want to do this? They give you an answer like uh, because it's faster. The second is why. So why is it faster? Well, because I've done research, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the third one is why. Why, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you keep it ready, you keep asking why, 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 until either they get stuck and they give up, <laughs> or you have an actually answer that you can live with, and then, then it's fine. Think about time and effort. Uh, I have something that may be already there. Uh, if I copy it, it takes one minute. If I want to make it generic, it takes a lot of more time, but maybe the next use case takes less time. But do we know there will be a next use case? We don't know yet. So think about time and effort. Sometimes it can even help building something uh, generic because you're pretty sure you're going to need it in 10 places, like, I don't know, logging, metrics, security, those course coding concerns that you have everywhere. Also be aware of the myth of the first time right. 
well, we want to build this. This is the first time we see this. We're pretty sure that we completely understand all the use cases in the entire context. We're going to build this perfect right away. And then you see the second use case and then you figure out that it was a myth of getting it the first time right. And also think about complexity and scope. So if something is, is really complex, well, then it may make sense to, uh, to, to put it away in a library as some sort of encapsulation. So if you have a specialized team working on something like uh, authentication or encryption, not them saying that you should do this yourself, but think about complexity in, in terms of topics. It may help building this generic, so there's only a couple of people who are able to touch it, and the rest just is using this true well-defined APIs. And the rule of three, we'll look at that uh, in a bit. And, and I'm um, uh, countering my previous point, future needs and evolution, but only if you know them. If you know there are going to be changes in the future. If you don't know them, don't try to predict them because you're not going to get them anyway. So as Gunnar Molling, uh, a friend of mine, uh, said, uh, a fair share of software design is about professional procrastination. So keeping options on the table and doors open for as long as you can uh, to avoid locking yourself into a corner by committing too early on something. So that we will see more about this when we look at the cost of abstractions in a bit. So the rule of three, it's, it's a simple rule. When you're reusing code, you copy it once. So that's the second time you're using it and you only abstract the third time you have this use case. This helps you avoid writing the wrong abstraction. And it's easier to make a, a good abstraction from duplicated code than to make a wrong abstraction and then try to refactor this wrong abstraction into the right abstraction. So you could also see this as three strikes and, and you refactor. So the first use case, just build it, don't genericize at all. Just solve the problem in front of you. May not be just, but just solve it. Second case, you duplicate the original. You redesign a bit, and maybe you extract common behavior while, you're cha while you change. But you can still keep this common behavior local in, in both places. And in the third case, you look at the lessons from your first two passes, then you can design a generic solution that will fit all those three cases, and then will make it easy to extend your third case. So another uh, approach that can help is to apply a set of design heuristics. So you're going to look at a problem in a couple of passes. So the first one, Yagni, your rule of three, try to make it as simple and specific as possible. You can always do this. The second one, based on what you now know of the, the solution domain, so how you've solved this problem, is it less work to make a generic solution now or in the future? And the third pass, based on, on your problem domain, so now you understand the problem because you, you built something, is the easiest solution actually correct? Or are there more less trivial use cases that we need to look into? Make it, make it more complex. And then the fourth pass, looking at uh, a customer behavior or, or other non-technical considerations, does this change your decision? Because, okay, uh, we have other reasons why this should be generic, because I know it should be a pluggable module or a plugin or, or whatever. So a final concept you can apply is uh, strategic design. And this is a concept from uh, DDD, Domain Driven Design. And uh, you can use it as a tool to help decide between generic and specific, but mainly about building something yourself or not. So in strategic design, you, you uh, basically state that there are uh, three different subdomains in your code. So the first is your core domain. The core domain is what makes you and your business special. It's what you are really good at, what you excel at, and without this piece of functionality in your software, your software could not run or could not exist. So typically, this is something you always build yourself, and you have your best people working on this. Then it can be supporting subdomains, so stuff that is specific for your business, for your problem, for your product, but that you could probably leave out um, uh, and, and still have a working project. So you can even try to, you can either try to get like off-the-shelf products uh, for this and adapt them a bit, or maybe build it yourself if that turns out to work better or be less work. And then the third, one, the third one is generic subdomains. So a generic subdomain is something that is not specific to your business. It's a, a, a generally uh, recognized problem uh, where there are standard solutions. So this could be like accounting or finance or, uh, I don't know, uh, converting something to a PDF. And probably you can, typically you can use off-the-shelf solutions for this. So either a product, a SaaS, or a library that you can get from, from somewhere. 
and then there's more you need to consider because there's also organizational factors. So Melvin Conway said that organizations design systems that basically mirror their own communication structure. So if you have three teams working on a compiler, you'll get a three-pass compiler. And I guess my, my main point here is don't try to force a solution that goes against the structure of your organization. So if you have three teams that hate working together and they all three have the same problem, you have two options. Have them each build their own solution, maybe a bit more work, but they won't fight, or force them to use a generic solution. And then you're pretty sure that you will get fireworks, but not the type of fireworks you like, right? They're going to be fighting. So also consider organizational aspects uh, uh, there. So be careful to go generic when teams don't want to work together because they'll have discussions on how to solve things, on priority, on which, which does land in a generic solution and whatnot. If each has their own solution, they won't have these discussions. It may be more work, but there's less discussion. So, uh, well, you need to weigh those alternatives uh, and in the end decide what's best for your organization. So to give an example, um, I used to work um, for an educational publisher and they wanted to build a new generation of e-learning applications. But there were three business units that were working fairly independent, had their own budget, uh, had their own uh, uh, planning, and they all had money to, to build a new system. But in the end, we found that we ended up with three e-learning systems. Um, because of they all had their own budget, their own teams, and they all had their own requirements, if you would zoom out a bit, they would be fairly the same, but they have still some, some uh, differences on a low level. So the organization didn't want to work together. So as an IT department, we mainly let them believe that we were working specifically for them. And then inside the IT department, we looked at, okay, are there generic components that we can share, like session management or, I don't know, getting educational content on the screen. But it probably wouldn't have worked at all if we would have built one generic e-learning system because there would have been way too much fighting between the people actually paying for those uh, solutions. So it's an interesting, uh, uh, well, dynamic that, that it, it helps to be, to be aware of. So let's think about cost. Going generic probably will save you time in the long run, right? Once you have something generic, then next time it's free to use it because you've already built it, you can reuse it. It doesn't cost you anything. Well, I, I tend to disagree. Um, Another rule of three is that you can say that building reusable components is three times as difficult as single use. Because talking between teams, matching, mapping different use cases on it, um, having different points of view about implementation. So the price you pay is coupling the three, the three teams that are using the same software. You have it both on a code level and on a people or team level because there's communication over it. I want to change something in the generic library. I want to change it now. Well, the second team doesn't have time to look at it, and the third team doesn't uh, agree with the changes that you're going to do. Then you're stuck. If it's only in your local code base, you don't need to talk to them. I'm not saying that it's a bad thing to talk to people, but the dependencies do slow you down uh, here. So what if you get it wrong? If you tend to pick the wrong, the wrong direction? Well, then let's look at the cost of abstractions uh, here. And I think it, it's fair to... Uh, to agree with each other that there are no zero cost abstractions. So every abstraction you make will cost you something in time or money or, or people. So in general, efficiency gains of going generic are typically clear, right? Next time somebody can use this and it won't cost them anything. They just need to integrate a generic solution. But how about onboarding new people? If just the code for your application is in one code base, you read through this code base, you are onboarded. If it's in some generic library, you need to hop out of the scope of your code base, find the code of the generic library, understand how it works. There may be use cases in there that are not relevant for your project, but are in there because they're relevant for other projects. So onboarding becomes uh, more difficult. It may be less readable, depending on how good you design the APIs of the generic library. Coupling, uh, uh, again. So if you think about writing bad abstractions, you're writing unnecessarily uh, reusable code because nobody's going to use it. You're introducing a necessary coupling. But it's even worse if you think about maintaining bad abstractions because they may be hard to see, they may be hard to understand, and they may be hard to extend. So if you have the wrong abstraction, it actually will cost you extra time every time you look at it and you want to change something. So why should you go generic then, or when? Well, let's start with bad reasons first. 
we've always done it like this. We always make things generic. Okay, uh, but that's not a reason why we should go generic now, right? Just apply the five Ws, keep asking why. We don't want to depend on libraries. So we're making something uh, ourselves, not invented here. We need to be future-proof, so we need to be really generic so we can accommodate future changes. Well, we all heard how well that worked with the really flexible application, uh, right? Because the product owner wants it. Well, the product owner can go think about product stuff and, and not technical stuff, right? They should join the development team if they want to think about technical stuff. Because the architect wants it. That's my favorite one. So this, this is a form of uh, an appearance that I like to call seagull architecture. So seagull architecture is when the architect behaves like a seagull, a zeemeel. So hoovering high above the teams, diving, every, every, diving down every now and again, shouts, Wah! <laughs> shits on developers below, steals their french fries and flies back up again. <laughs> that is seagull architecture. So whenever somebody does this to you, just refer them if they've ever heard about seagull architecture, and if not, tell them the story. If the architects wants it, they, I think they still have a responsibility to convince the team that this is a good idea, and, and write down why they did it. Because then, at least in two years from now, you can tell the architect told you so, it wasn't a good idea. Obviously, it's hard in this stage of a project to look into the future to see whether something is going to work or not, right? So valid research, the rule of three checks out. It's the third time you're seeing something. You're pretty sure you're going to need it almost everywhere. Metrics, logging, tracing, security, uh, I don't know, a generic library for database access. Then it's fine. It's a library that a lot of teams will use. That's basically the same as my previous point. Or, I think I told it before, complex logic that only a couple of people have. Then you can use a generic solution as encapsulation for this complex logic or when the gains are bigger than, than the cost. But that may be hard to make really concrete at any point of a, of a project. So if you look at it in, 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 uh, in different scopes, think back about the layers in hierarchical decomposition of a system. So context, uh, containers, components, uh, classes. Code versus component versus service. And ask yourself, are there considerations to go generic or specific? Are they the same on every level? Do you make the same, uh, do you weigh the same pros and cons on when making something generic on a code level versus making something generic on organization level? Well, I think the risk is, is definitely is higher if you get it wrong on organization level. So when the level is higher, because then uh, it impacts maybe 10 teams. And when you make a local wrong decision on your code, it only impacts your team. And I think it's also important to not confuse generification with standardization. So, for example, you can say, we standardize on OAuth in our company. All authentication should be OAuth. That's fine, but that's, that doesn't mean that you should have a generic implementation for OAuth. Uh, maybe there are different uh, use cases. There are simple OAuth servers, clients, maybe some have grants, some not, some have roles, some not. So you can still standardize on OAuth and having a specific implementation of OAuth in every project. Not saying that authentication is the best example, but I, th I think you, you catch my point. So it's time for a couple of um, stories or examples. Um, why specific code is often faster than generic code. So we're going to look at a little hobby of mine. This hobby is code challenges. So I often compete in code competitions, and there's different challenges there, like who solves this the fastest, the ugliest, uh, the quickest, uh, the shortest, etc. So one is uh, code golf. So with code golf, you need to solve a problem in the least amount of characters of code as possible. So every character counts, spaces, uh, whatever. So this, you need to be really creative to, to be really short here. So I remember participating in Code Golf a while ago, and the challenge was that you should uh, validate a uh, bank account number. So it's something we call the uh, LF proof in the Netherlands. There's rules that can say a bank account number is valid. And I immediately knew that I didn't have the theoretical and mathematical skills to win uh, in an honest approach. Because, well, there were, there were people going to be that knew all things about bit shifting that are really smart. And, I, well, I don't know much about bit shifting. But then I figured out that uh, it was running on probably in, in a Lambda somewhere, your solutions. And I, I figured out, what if I lock all the, um, uh, all the numbers that are in a test case to a remote server? So I did that. 
and there were only 10 numbers in the, in the test case. So I could basically say, uh, reply, uh, return, third character is even, or fifth character is, uh, is odd, and then it's a valid number for those test cases. So it was really fast, and I was on top of the list of uh, the shorter solution. But then they found out that I was doing this, uh, and I got caught, and uh, well, uh, they added test cases. So my next solution was to build a client server application in 200 bytes where I would basically call a remote server, validate it there, and then get back, and well, still. Uh, the, 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 the bit shifting people were faster. But I think the, um, the, the first solution is an example because it was really specific, tailored to the problem domain of those 10 bank account numbers, and it was really fast. So a better example, I think, is about advent of code. So advent of code, who knows about advent of code, of you? Cool, it's a code challenge that starts on December 1st. There's a new code challenge every day until Christmas. And uh, the, the person who solves it the fastest, and new challenges arise at 6 a.m. Uh, Central European time, gets the most amount of points. So the first day, I, wasn't, I, I was away, I think I was abroad. I got a message from uh, our director saying, hey, but John, haha, I'm ahead of you in a code challenge. And I'm like, what? That cannot happen. So I set my alarm clock to 5.45 for, a whole, for the whole month of December to try to catch up. Family hated it. But to, to give an example of a such a challenge, here you needed to uh, parse some text input, which is on the, the lower left bottom. These are stacks of crates, so wooden crates with, with labels. Uh, and for example, uh, you need to parse the initial set of crates, and then the first line says move one from two to one. So you move the D from stack two to stack one. So now D is on top of the first stack. And this is a trivial example, but this was the actual code that I needed to work with. And when I saw this, my inner uh, developer heart went beating faster, right? So, oh, I need to build a generic uh, parser of this, I need to build a matrix uh, class so I can do matrix operations, and uh, yes, and that's all going to work. And half an hour later, I had something like this to generally parse it and matrix, and, and then I saw the code from a colleague, and it looked like this. And he basically had, had, had designed it in, in like nine array lists, where you could just add stuff on the end and pop them and push them. This was way faster and way more specific, so in this case, uh, I think it's a good example why specific is typically a lot faster. But to counter my um, example, um, there are also cases where generic can be a lot faster. Think when you need to handle exceptions in, for example, a Java or, or a Spring application. You can, if you have like a thousand REST endpoints, you can have um, exception handling in every REST endpoint uh, programmed manually. Or you can do something like this that I recently uh, saw. So this is a, uh, well, generic, uh, controller advice, so it wraps around all your spring controllers, and then you have basically a generic way to handle uh, exceptions uh, by, by, by replying uh, some error response to the, um, uh, to the caller. So I think this is a nice way where going generic actually saves, uh, saves time. It is more difficult to understand because you get a nice form of error response. You look at your own code, you have no idea where it comes from, but it does save you loads and loads of typing on specific uh, responses in, in every separate REST controller. Final example is uh, about reusing code for a website. Uh, well, we have a lot of websites at OpenValue, but my favorite one is openvalue.cat, and it has a list of all our cats. So when we built this, uh, at, well, well, partly as a joke, but we basically programmed everything uh, manually. So all the cats here are programmed manually, and then when we needed to add things, we need to change the HTML and stuff, and that was a lot of work. So when we found out that we regularly need to change it, we, we uh, found out, okay, maybe we can just generate this page based on a JSON definition of the cats uh, we have. Uh, and that turned out to be, uh, uh, well, pretty useful because, so there was like a simple refactoring, because somebody recently asked like, hey, why don't we have openvalue.doc? So now we can reuse this code for openvalue.doc to make a list of, of all the docs we have in the company. But to apply the rule of three, obviously we're first going to copy this site because it's the second time, put the dogs in there, and not until we want to list our, I don't know, crocodiles, then we're going to make a generic open value animal site, uh, right? So, uh, bonus topic, let's look at uh, generic first specific on, on, uh, on organization level. So if you think about sharing code within an organization, uh, well, sharing code in an organization is easy, right? You just give code to others. But doing it efficiently at scale is pretty hard. Because sharing code at scale means that you, well, you probably have multiple modules from multiple teams that share code. There's multiple team members or even multiple teams that work together. There's a high rate of change because loads of people are working uh, together on this. Uh, and, uh, well, you also want to have little to no loss of individual productivity. So the challenges you have is 
what do you do with uh, refactoring when you're renaming a field that has input impact on upstream or downstream projects? How are you going to involve uh, them? Uh, versioning, do you let everyone upgrade at their own pace or do you first, do you force uh, upgrades of generic libraries to all teams? Reviewing, when somebody um, uh, need to change dependent projects as well, uh, the change set may become pretty large, or maybe there's only specific people that can review changes in generic libraries. And how do you handle builds and your code base size? Are you going to use monorepositories or not? How many of you um, are aware of what monorepositories are? Okay, most of you. And how many of you are a fan of monorepositories? <laughs> a bit less. So the, the deal with monorepositories is that well, you have long, one large repository for a group of projects, possibly all projects in your organization. The good thing is that it's easy to make changes across projects. You want to refactor something, you refactor it in one code base, one commit, you're good to go. The bad thing is that it's easy to make dependencies between all those projects in there because they're in one repository and build times can increase if you have 100 or 1,000 projects uh, in there. So uh, considerations you can have when you're sharing code in your organization is think about your discovery process. So what, what code or libraries uh, do exist in, in your company and how can people find them? Do you have a documentation site or an, I don't know, an API discovery site or how does a new hire know which libraries or services they can use or reuse? How are you going to distribute your generic stuff? Are you having a, a source dependency? So a, a, a project depends on some Git repository that's generic or are you going to build a binary like a, a jar or a zip file or an NPM uh, dependency? If you import those uh, generic projects, do you think about well-defined APIs that expose the things you need? Or is there chaos and everybody can add anything to APIs or generic projects? How do you handle versioning of generic stuff? Upgrades, lifecycle management, who maintains it? So these are all, I think, re relevant questions to, to figure out whenever you want to share libraries within a bigger organization. So a possible approach can be having kind of like an inner source culture. So having projects that you can see as open source projects with maintainers assigned and teams who want to change stuff there can, can basically do pull requests to change things there. Uh, that may work, uh, on the other hand, your knowledge may, may vary. It's different for every organization. So to summarize, should you go generic or specific? Well, you can consider, you ain't gonna need it. You can consider the rule of three, the five whys. Consider what's the cost of going generic. It may be a bit more work to do now. It may also cost more time to understand, to maintain in the future. Think about scope and level. Go generic on a class level, on a module level, on a service level, on an organization level. Think about Conway's law. If teams don't want to work together, maybe don't first them to use generic libraries. And I, I think also about sharing code on organization level. So a simple question, should you go generic or specific? Also a simple answer. It depends, right? So uh, in the end, it's, it's, it's not necessarily about getting it right from the start, but about getting it right in the end. Because if I need to give you um, uh, an example here, is that I think this is from uh, a clean architecture probably. Uh, a, a program that works perfectly now, but is impossible to change, will become useless because you cannot change it. Whereas if you reverse this, a problem that program does not work at all, but is easy to change, this will become and remain useful continuously. So I think being adaptable is, is the, the key point here. So I need to give you one piece of advice that I hope will stick. It's also simple. It's write simple code. That's it. Please go kick some ass with your newfound knowledge. <laughs>